What is going on YouTube? Ohara here. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. And today we will be looking at Dawn Island and the Goa Kingdom, which is the very first island to have ever appeared in a One Piece story. And yes, it is the very same island that Luffy started his adventure from. In this video, we will be looking at its geography, its history, the people who live there, and what the future holds for the place. As always guys, if you're not familiar with the One Piece manga, be careful, cause there will be spoilers ahead. But now without further ado, let's get right into it. Now before we get into the details of the island and the kingdom on it, I want to talk a little bit about where in the One Piece world exactly Dawn Island is located to better understand the role it plays in the world. And in order to do that, first of all we have to look at the One Piece world in general. And as you might know, the One Piece world is one big planet that we haven't learned the name of yet. And this planet consists mostly of one huge ocean, which is called the Blue Sea, and it makes up pretty much the entire world. The only elements that disturb this huge masses of water on the entire planet is one big continent, the so-called Red Line. It is a huge continent that spans around the whole world in a circle and kind of splits the planet in half like that. The next really important element is the so-called Grand Line. It is a very long chain of islands that runs in 90 degree angle to the Red Line and also spans around the world. And due to this angle, the Grand Line and the Red Line kind of split the world into four quarters. And each of these quarters are different seas. And there are four seas, obviously, for four quarters. The first is the North Blue in the North, the South Blue in the South, the West Blue in the West, and the East Blue in the East. And this is also where our island, Dawn Island, is located and where most of the first part of the One Piece story takes place. Before we move on to the East Blue, I want to quickly mention that of course there's also the Calm Belt in the One Piece world. That is a zone that spans the Grand Line that basically makes it impossible or nearly impossible to move in to the Grand Line by any of the seas, by any other means than using the way over Reverse Mountain. It is an area without currents, without wind, which is why it's called the Calm Belt. But also additionally, you can't just row over the calm belt because it is filled with sea kings, the giant monsters of the sea that we also got to know in the first chapter of One Piece. And last but not least, there are so-called sky oceans. There is the White Sea and the White White Sea that are oceans in the sky made of cloud-like substances uh, that also have islands and uh, inhabitants and people living in the sky. So that is pretty much what the One Piece world is made out of. Now let's take a closer look at the ocean where Dawn Island is located, rather the East Blue. And the East Blue is, like I just said, one of the four great seas that span the One Piece world. And like the other three seas, it is basically almost entirely made out of water. And there are some islands that are scarcely scattered across the sea. Due to the geography of the world, the East Blue of course also borders the Red Line, which acts like a natural border between the different seas. And in one of the movies, it is also referred to as the Sea of Schemes by a group of villagers. In general, the East Blue is known as the weakest seas in the rest of the world, which means that even pirates who are regarded as really threatening or high class or dangerous pirates or infamous pirates in the East Blue are rather seen as weak and insignificant in the other seas. And this belief is especially pronounced in the Grand Line, where pirates from the East Blue are rather smiled upon as weak or not strong enough. So it is the more ironic, actually, when you think about it, that the East Blue was the birthplace of the late pirate king, Goldie Roger, after all. So it's really interesting that even though some of the strongest pirates, or the strongest pirate in the world at that time, comes from the East Blue, and that it still didn't manage to get rid of this image Kind of makes you wonder, is it really a fact that like pirates from the East Blue are especially weak? Or is it more of a fact that the East Blue might be just a little bit more peaceful than, for example, the North Blue, who is known for its uh, great warfare that's going on in the kingdom with, for example, the Germa or Law, who are from the North Blue, or also Sanji, of course. And even though no official map of the East Blue with the exact location of all the islands exists, it is still mostly assumed that Dawn Island and the Goa Kingdom are located rather far away from the Grand Line and that's the reason why Luffy had to pass all of those islands in the East Blue arc. And in many maps you'll find the island is located somewhere in the northeast of the sea. 
So this is basically the layout of the East Blue, and where Dawn Island fits into this ocean. So now that we know where Dawn Island is located in the One Piece world, and more precisely in the East Blue, let's talk about the island itself and how it's structured. So basically, Dawn Island has not been named in the One Piece manga until chapter 584, which was rather late in the story, shortly after the war of the Greatest at Marineford. More importantly though, it was the very first island to have appeared in the whole series, in the very first chapter of the manga. Because we know that Fusha Village, Luffy's birthplace and the place where he met Shanks is on the very same island, and it has appeared in the very first chapter of One Piece, if you have followed my recent videos. Also, there are some really interesting connections between Dawn Island and Loke Town, where Roger's journey to become the King of the Pirates began. Because Loke kind of reminds you of uh, a prologue or an epilogue, which kind of refers to the beginning or the end of a story, same as the dawn, kind of marks the threshold from the old to the new day. So kind of both of the cities have like a symbolism that refers to the beginning or the end of something. And it kind of draws a nice connection between the two characters of Luffy and Roger and kind of shows that both their stories uh, started with this place. And we'll see if Luffy's story also ends with this place, same as for Roger. We'll see that in the future, I guess. Also, I would like to mention here that the name Dawn Island itself might be a very good reason that the first arc in One Piece is called Roman's Dawn as well. So now let's look a little bit into the geography and the structure of the island itself. And the very first thing you will notice is that the whole island of Dawn Island is basically spanned by a kingdom that is called the Goa Kingdom. And the whole place mostly consists of rural farmland with cows and a lot of grass, which is also what we are shown in the very first chapter of One Piece when we are introduced to Luffy and Fusha Village itself. The capital though is a little different. It is a huge city in a shape of a circle that is surrounded by a really really high wall. And the city itself is surrounded by a forest and also by a chain of rather low mountains that are covered by forest. Sadly, we do not know how many people live in the Goa Kingdom itself, or even how many villages there are. The only real village we know is Fusha Village, which is located on the other side of the mountains that kind of guard the capital city. Also, one of the mountains in those mountain chains around the capital is known to us as Mount Kolubo, which is where the bandits live that raised Luffy, Sabo and Ace. Another place we know of is the forest that spans between the mountains and the walls of the capital. It is called the Midway Forest, and it's home to a lot of very gruesome beasts. Next, in front of the huge gates, we have the so-called Grey Terminal, which is basically a huge dump yard. And on a small patch of water that flows inward from the ocean, um, between the mountains and the forest, is called Pirate's Bay. And in the center of all those mountains, near the coast, surrounded by forests and surrounded by those huge walls, there is the capital city where the royalty and the nobility lives. So now that we've learned of all those places, I want to get a little bit more into the details of what those places look like and what makes them special and what characterizes them. And the first place we'll be looking at is Fusha Village. And we know that it's a very peaceful village, also very sleepy, um, it's very rural. A lot of fields with cows, we see a lot of windmills, it's also called the Windmill Village. And it lies a little bit on the outskirts of the main Goa Kingdom, down in the plains, on the foot of the mountain ranges. It is known to be Luffy's home and birthplace, and it is also where Luffy met with Shanks for the first time, and the place where he got inspired to be a pirate, and also the place of course where he got the scar and uh, got into the fight with the bandit crew. The village itself is run by a mayor that's called Whoopslap. So we also know of two distinct locations in the village. The first is the party's bar that is run by Makino, who works there as a bartender. It is the place of the first confrontation between the Shanks pirates and the bandits in the first chapter, and also where Luffy eats his devil fruit actually. Uh, Makino herself has a child after the time skip, and it makes you kind of wonder if uh, maybe Shanks kind of dropped by a little uh, during the time skip in the village itself and went a little back on a break into the East Blue. The second place that we learn of in Fusha Village is UO, which is kind of a fish store, I would say, that is owned by a man called Gyoru. And uh, Luffy is going there buying fish in also the first chapter. 
Um, Gyoro has a wife that is called Chicken, which is a very interesting name for a wife to have. And otherwise, we don't really know of any more citizens, even though we, we see a lot of them looking concerned or waving at Luffy when he leaves to, uh, to his journey. But we, we'd never learn any names of the village. But it seems to be rather small, only consisting out of a few houses. The last thing you should know about Fusha Village is that it has a sea monster at its coast that is called the Lord of the Coast. And it's basically a smaller kind of uh, sea king that kind of attacks every ship that tries to land there or come close to the coast or also leave from the coast. So it kind of protects the village in a way while it also isolates it uh, from the world or at least from setting out to sea. The next place we're looking at is Mount Korubo. It is the mountain that you can always see in the back of Fusha village and it marks one of the mountains in the mountain range between the capital and the village itself. It is very heavily forested, there's a lot of vegetation and trees there and the mountains are rather low. It is the home of uh, several bandit groups, um, most prominently the Dalan family that is the bandit group that adopted Luffy, Ace and Sabo. But it was also probably the home of the bandit Higuma and his crew who were eliminated by the Shanks pirates. After Higuma's death through the Lord of the Coast, the Sea King monster in the port, um, and Shang's departure from the village itself, going back probably to the Grand Line, Garb came back to the village and took Luffy from Fusha village to Mount Kurubo um, to live with the Darden family after he already had put Ace there, um, whom he kind of adopted on Roger's bid. So Luffy and Ace conducted both of their trainings there, kind of under the supervision of, of Dardan, the bandit leader, the family leader, but mostly trained by Garp, who dropped by here and then to, to train both of them. Later on, Sabo also moved in with the bandit crew after he left the capital, and uh, the three of them would spend a lot of time in this area, adventuring and uh, fighting and training and basically getting unusually strong for their age in a very, or at a very rapid pace. Moving closer again to the capital, between Mount Kurubo and the capital itself lies Midway Forest, which is a foresty area between the mountains and the walls of the capital itself. It is mostly known to the people of the Goa Kingdom as a very dangerous place to be for any human, and that is because there's a lot of beasts living there, dangerous animals, and dangerous places to walk around in. Of course we know that Sabo and Ace, before Sabo moved in with uh, him and Luffy, the two of them used the place as kind of a hideout or training ground in their youth and they would steal uh, values, treasures and uh, other loot from people in the city or at the Grey Harbor and they would store all that treasure in a uh, like hidden storage system they integrated in a big tree in the forest. The plan was basically to use the money or the treasure to finance their ambitions of becoming a pirate later on and leave the island itself. Luffy though, who was very attached to Ace and wanted him to recognize him, uh, followed Ace into the forest and was able to, after many hardships, actually locate and find the location where they hid their treasure and find Ace and Sabo there. And after that, kind of the trio of them were roaming through the mountains and the midway forest and training and fighting beasts. And when the Blue Gem pirates set the Great Terminal on fire and after they defeated their captain Blue Gem, Ace and Adam took refuge near a river in the forest to protect themselves from the flames. Once you reach the edge of the forest, you will see a huge junkyard that is located in front of the gates of the Goa Kingdom capital. It is basically a huge wasteland with uh, thrown out and unwanted yeah, things, goods, machines, trash, and also all the unwanted people of the capital and the kingdom itself. It is a rather lawless land where people live in poverty and without any medical care. So many people are very sick and uh, are dying and starving. And Sabo actually lived there for some time in secret when he ran away from the capital and uh, lived there with some of the other refugees there. Those people have to make their living by collecting and rummaging through the different things that can be found in the trash yard and kind of look for valuable things to, to sell back to citizens 
of uh, of the city itself or other people in the tra- in the trunk yard itself. At one point, the world government actually issued a inspection to be done in the Goa Kingdom because they saw it as a successful example of a society where everything unnecessary is removed. At least that's how Oda put it. So they basically sent down a celestial dragon to inspect if uh, they were actually living as a country that is worthy of being part of the world government. And to basically get rid of all the trash, um, the very easy and obvious thing to do was destroy Great Terminal since it was like an accumulation of all bad and unwanted things in the kingdom. So the nobility, of course, trying not to get their hands dirty, kind of paid the Blue Gem Pirates to set up explosives and uh, set fire to the Great Terminal and destroy it. And he actually did that. And a lot of a lot of people died, but luckily Dragon arrived in time to, to save also a lot of people to get on their boat of the revolutionaries. And afterwards, we really don't know what happened to the Great Terminal, if people came back to it and are living in it again after the inspection or uh, if it's empty now, but it's most likely used again as a dump yard for the capital city. Also, like a small fun fact here, the Great Terminal itself was based on Smoky Mountain Slum, that is a very famous slum in Manila and the Philippines. It was um, populated by the same kind of ravagers who lived in the dump yard and like made the living out of the, the things there. And I always like how Oda kind of implements those things and gets inspiration from real life problems or circumstances. Same as for example also in Wano Country that is also based on real events from the past or real problems that the Japanese country had in the past. Another location that is only shortly mentioned is the so-called Pirate's Bay. It is kind of located between the Great Terminal, the mountains and the forests. And it is basically just a patch of ocean that stretches a little bit further inwards the country. And it is where the Blue Gem Pirates actually used to be stationed and have their ship. Otherwise, the location is not really referenced anymore. Next on, we have the capital city itself, which is surrounded by those huge, huge walls and has a great entrance gate that opens up to the Great Terminal. And this gate kind of connects the Great Terminal, where all the poor people live to the first circle in the city, which is called Edge Town, where basically all the normal people of the country or of the capital live. And while they are not nobility or rich, they have a decent life, they live in, in nice houses, they can buy nice things, um, but they're not wealthy enough or rich enough to, to afford super luxurious things, so they also have a regular trade with the people from the Great Terminal and are kind of like the buffer zone between the very poor and the very rich. Next to Edgetown there is the town center, um, which is kind of where the richer people live. It is also where you're able to get more luxurious goods or more expensive goods and also, again, works kind of as a buffer zone between normal people and royalty. Next up we have Hightown, and this is actually where the nobles reside, so uh, also Sabo's family for example. It is a clean area with huge and rich houses, where basically all the great mansions of the nobility are located. And it's also of course where most of the nobility's everyday life takes place. Hightown is also shielded by the town center in Edgetown, by a small wall again. And again, in the center of Hightown, there's a plateau, which uh, serves as a base for the royal palace where the royalty lives, so the king and queen and uh, the ruling family of the Goa Kingdom. So now that we've learned how the basic geography and layout of the Goa Kingdom is, let's look a little bit into who actually lives there. So we kind of have five groups of inhabitants that live in the Goa Kingdom, or are from the Goa Kingdom. And first of all, of course, on top we have the royalty, the people who actually rule over the Goa kingdom. Under the royal family, we have the nobles, who are like the aristocratic families of the country and aspire to be basically married into the royal family as well, and the most wealthy and uh, luxurious living, of course. Next on, of course, we have regular citizens who live, for example, in Fusha village or in the lower parts of the city capital. And then we have the two groups that are kind of like outcasts in a sense. So you have bandits and pirates and maybe also additionally 
um, the people who live in the Great Terminal, because they're also not really considered people in a way. So let's start with the royality. And at the moment, as you guys might remember, since we've just recently seen him, the current king of the Goa Kingdom is King Steli, basically Sabo's stepbrother, who succeeded the previous king after he died for mysterious reasons, uh, quote unquote. <laughs> so I think we all know what happened there. And he's actually married to the former princess, Queen Sari Nantokanet, if that's how you pronounce her. Nantokanet? Yeah, I guess, I guess that's how you would spell her. Steli, as we know, is currently at the Reverie, together with Sabo, who uh, I'm really, really curious um, what will happen there. But we'll see in the future, I guess. And next on, we have the nobles that we know of. And, well, it's not, it's not a lot of people who we know of. We know, of course, of Sabo himself, who is probably not considered a noble anymore, since uh, he's a revolutionary now and a world, like, world-renowned uh, person with a heavy bounty on his head. But, of course, we also have his parents, Outlook III, his father, and Sabo's mother, who wasn't honored with a name. And also we know of... Aho Dezunen, the ninth, and Aho, by the way, just for you guys who, who know a little Japanese, it's of course idiot, so um, we can see what Oda was trying to impose there. And his daughter, Aho Surako, also nice family name again, like it's always good to be called an idiot. <laughs> and uh, of course they are not introduced in a very positive light as well. Next up we have the citizens of the kingdom, and again, we basically only know the citizens of Fusha village here, since uh, we didn't meet anyone else with a real name in the capital. And we have, of course, Makino, as mentioned before, with her child. We have Whoopslap, the mayor of Fusha village. We have Kyoru and his wife with the great name of Chicken. And last but not least, we have Garp, who we know is from the Goa kingdom and who is a vice admiral in the Marines. And also, he's the father of Monkey D. Dragon and the grandfather of Luffy. And also kind of like a, yeah, father figure or taken father for Ace. Now the first group of outlaws we're looking at will be the bandits. And we basically know kind of two groups of bandits. First of all, there's the Higuma bandits, who are by now all perished since the crew was kind of soloed by Ben Backman and Higuma himself was killed by the sea monster when he was trying to abduct Luffy. And the other group of bandits is Dadan's family, of course. The bandit family who took in and raised and trained Luffy, Sabo and Ace. Their leader is Curly Dadan, who is like a yeah, very masculine, little fattish woman with a long orange curly hair who used to be very beautiful in her youth. And even though she kind of starts off rough with all three of them, she starts to grow fond of them very, very fast and actually cares deeply for all three of them. The way she came into care of Luffy and Ace is actually really funny because she kind of seems to be blackmailed by Garp into uh, taking care of the kids. Basically him saying, oh, if you don't look after them, uh, I, will, I will throw you into prison with you and your bandits. So it's not really that she has a choice, but in a weird way they have like a kind of friendship going on, I guess. And two other named members of the bandit family are Dogra, who's like a rather small guy with a turban, and Magra who's a big guy who has like a, a beard and kind of haircut that reminds you of a chicken. And also there's a small dog living with the bandit that's called Pochi that looks uh, kind of like he doesn't really care about anything in the world. I mean, look at that face. What does it tell you? And last but not least, we have, of course, the pirate crews or the different pirates uh, related to the Goa kingdom. And of course, the first pirates that will come to mind there is Shanks and his crew. But since they're not really from the Goa Kingdom, but just where they're like as visitors, um, I would kind of like let leave them out of the list here. Rather interesting though, of course, Monkey D. Dragon, who's a revolutionary, not a pirate, but still the most most wanted person in the world. So I think it's worth worth mentioning that he's from this island for sure. And of course. His son, Monkey D. Luffy, who now uh, is considered one of the Emperors of the Sea and is currently in Wano Kuni. Also, of course, we have uh, Ace, who also grew up with Luffy on the island and also became a world-renowned pirate under Whitebeard, also one of the Emperors 
but as we sadly know, has perished. Next on we have the Blue Jam Pirates, who is the pirate crew that uh, was tasked by the nobility to set the Great Terminal on fire, and uh, who actually fought Ace and Luffy and Sabo later on in the story. Um, their captain is Blue Jam, who is probably still alive. He was defeated by Dadan and Ace together, and probably started a new crew after the Great Terminal burned down. Um, one of his crew members we know by name is Porchimi, and he was actually killed by Blue Jam for losing against the kids. So, very sympathetic person there. And the last pirate we know about um, from the Goa Kingdom is Naguri, who is actually an uh, anime-only character, he's not appearing in the manga, but he's interesting or worth mentioning for the reason that he's actually one of the few people who we know of that has Conqueror's Hockey. And uh, he actually was uh, fighting Roger in his youth and had his crew uh, destroyed by him. And he's living in the outskirts of the city, also helping out Luffy, Ace and Sabo when they were fighting a big bear and demonstrating his Conqueror's Hockey there. So even though he's not canon, he's for sure a very interesting character in a way as well. So now that we got to know the history and also the locations and geography of the place, uh, let's look a little bit into what the future could hold for Dawn Island and the Goa Kingdom itself. So first of all, even though the Goa Kingdom and Dawn Island is usually seen as a very peaceful and rural and more simple country or island by the other islands in the East Blue, um, it has still pr produced some of the most infamous uh, people in the world, for example Luffy or Ace, uh, Garp or also Dragon of course. Additionally, even though we got to know Pusha village as a very peaceful place and there might be a lot more villages like that in the island too, we got to see the capital and the area surrounding it as a very gruesome place and actually later on in Dressrosa, Luffy and Sabo compare it uh, to the Goa kingdom since both islands kind of function through those hardcore divisions between rich and poor and the suppression through the royal family. As a matter of fact, in the current story, the reverie is still going on, and Stelly, the current king and Sabo's stepbrother, is still, as the king of the Goa Kingdom, represented in Marie Joa and taking part in the World Conference. And as a matter of fact, as we know, also the Revolutionary Army, including Sabo, is there to try some kind of coup. So it will be really, really interesting to see in what direction that goes. Also, it will be interesting to see, as mentioned before, if Luffy will at one point come back after his journey is complete and uh, what kind of reunion he will have with his home country and hometown. And we hope also to learn a little bit more about Dragon and his past and maybe also about some other people who might be as well from the Goa Kingdom. For example, Luffy's mother, who we don't know anything about yet. So hope guys that I could give you a nice overview over the Goa Kingdom and Dawn Island itself and help you understand a little bit better where Luffy comes from and what makes this place so special and what place it holds in the story and what potential it has for the future. I'm really curious to what you guys think, like what are your impressions of the country itself, um, what does it remind you of, do you have any connections to real places in the world, what or who would you like to get to know better from the Goa Kingdom itself, and what are your thoughts on the future of the country and the developments at the Reverie, especially for Steli and Sabo. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, if you liked it leave me a thumbs up, if you didn't leave me a thumbs down, share your thoughts in the comments below, and otherwise I see you next time and until then, have a great week.